Hello and welcome to this short video about the history of psychiatry. We're going to look through some of the key events over the last 10,000 years in about 10 minutes. It all starts back in prehistoric times. We're not sure entirely what trepanation was used for, but it may reflect one of the earliest attempts to cure psychiatric illness by releasing evil spirits from inside the head. Our first written accounts of psychiatric illnesses come from a variety of sources. The Ebers Papyrus from the Egyptians documents illnesses that sound like, very much like depression. Vedic texts from the ancient Hindu civilizations also talk about mental illness and theorize that it's a result of imbalanced humors within the body. And ancient Chinese texts also document cases of dementia, madness, and epilepsy. And even these are written 500 years before Hippocrates, who was the first Western European to begin to describe mental illness in written form. His work was built on through the Greek tradition and people like Theophrastus started to describe personality or temperament. Other people built on Hippocrates' theory of the four humours and tried to link that to mental illness. Into the Roman era, Galen refined Hippocratic theory and believed that depression was caused by an accumulation of black bile or melancholicos. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire, Western Europe descended into a more demonological explanation for mental illness. But a lot of the ancient wisdom was preserved and built on by Arabic scholars who were the first to build psychiatric hospitals, the first opening in Baghdad around the beginning of the 8th century. Avicenna, another Muslim physician, uh, published a lot of work on medical problems, but also detailed hallucinations, dementia, mania and depression in his works. In the West, it wasn't until 1247 that the first psychiatric hospitals in Europe opened. Bedlam, as it became known, took its first psychiatric patients in the 1350s. Things began to progress more towards a scientific understanding with the Renaissance in Europe and the re-emergence of scientific method, and people began to move away from demonological and religious explanations for mental illness. There was also a move to regulate physicians and doctors within the country with the founding of the Royal College of Physicians. There was also a renewal of interest and writing about mental illness, the classic anatomy of melancholy based on Robert Burton's own experiences of mental illness is one of the earlier examples of this. Around the same time, theories of mind were being put forward René Descartes' famous cogito ergo sum led to the assumption that the mind was somehow separate from the body. Provisions were also made to care for people with mental illnesses in a statutory way, and the building of asylums got going at around this time. Neuroanatomy and neuroscience also saw input. Thomas Willis wrote extensively about the anatomy of the brain, and also developed theories relating to psychiatric disorder. By the end of the 18th century, the madness of King George and his recovery in between bouts of porphyria gave hope that mental illness was potentially treatable. And this really coincided with a move to improve the conditions for people with mental illness in the asylums. Philip Pinnell was one of the earliest proponents of more humane ways for managing those who are unwell. He also contributed by categorising psychiatric illness in a more detailed and comprehensive way than had been previously done. It's not until just over 200 years ago that we get the first use of the word psychiatry by Johann Christian Ryle, who was writing a paper about the branches of medicine and how psychiatry fit into that scheme. Through the 19th century, neuropsychiatry was gathering pace with people like William Griesinger in Germany being very clear that he believed that brain diseases were responsible for mental illness. We also saw the foundation of the Royal College of Psychiatrists back in 1841. It was originally an association of medical officers for asylums, but it was granted a royal charter in 1926. 
As we approach the 20th century, we see Emil Kreppelin laying the foundations for the classifications of psychiatric syndromes that we recognise today. We also see developments in the theories relating to the unconscious mind with Sigmund Freud's work as the founding father of psychotherapy. He brought in the concepts of the id, ego and superego. Eugene Bloiler in 1911 was the first to coin the term schizophrenia, building on Kreplin's earlier concept of dementia precox. Further ideas about the unconscious mind were put forward by Carl Jung, who was originally a follower of Freud, who went on to develop his own theories about the subconscious. We began to be able to synthesise chemicals as well, and some of them had effect in psychiatric illness. Stimulants were found to improve concentration in children, for example. Other physical treatments began to emerge. Hugo Saletti in Italy began to deliver electroconvulsive therapy, which was vastly effective for patients with severe depression. And there was renewed hope that illnesses could be treated. John Cade in 1948 noticed that lithium salts could be used to calm people and began to use it in mania and it's still regarded as the, one of the best mood stabilisers to date. The big breakthrough came in 1951, though, with the discovery of antipsychotic drugs, ones that, for the first time, were able to improve people with psychotic illness, and it had dramatic results. People began to improve to the point where they could be discharged home, and the old asylums began to empty as people moved to a community-based model of treatment. Further improvements in technology led to new research routes that we can now see the brain in more detail with CT scans and then later on MRI. At the same time, new developments in psychology like CBT began to help people to learn strategies to manage their own illnesses like depression and OCD. We're now also able with PET scans to see where medications have their effect in the brain and identify which receptors the drugs bind to. As a result of that, we can better target medication and the SSRI and some of the newer antipsychotics have been designed to target specific receptors in the brain. We've now got functional imaging studies that can show the activity of the brain in real time, allowing us to see which areas might be involved in some of the symptoms of psychiatric illness and in other types of cognitive tasks. As well as developments in new antidepressants, we also saw the launch of atypical antipsychotics in the early 90s. Initially, it was hoped that these would be more effective and cause fewer side effects. There are also novel techniques being explored, such as deep brain stimulation, which look at stimulating small areas of the brain in order to regulate psychiatric symptoms. The next generation of antipsychotics are hoped to balance both the positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia by being partial agonists of dopamine receptors. And is dopamine the whole story for psychosis? There are promising results from studies using glutamate receptor antagonists as a new treatment pathway for psychosis. So with all the recent advances, the future is looking very promising and there are lots of opportunities for people moving into this field to really make fundamental discoveries about the nature of psychiatric illnesses. And if you want to find out more about psychiatry or what it takes to become a psychiatrist in the UK, you can find it in the other sections in the student area, right here on the Royal College website.